starting with this one. Okay, so we, we all know uh, E equals mc squared. Normally, uh, one goes in a nuclear reactor converting small amount of mass into energy. Uh, in our accelerators, we go the other way. We convert energy into mass. And if you want to create very heavy objects, then you need a lot of energy. And that's the reason that it took so many years to discover the Higgs boson. We never had enough energy. We didn't know how much we needed, but we never had enough energy. The LEC was designed uh, in a way, and I will tell you about the many innovative features uh, in, in, in the machine in a moment. Uh, it was designed in a way that if the Higgs boson existed, we were bound to find it. Well, this was the first uh, circular uh, particle accelerator from Lawrence in 1930. Uh, the, uh, the LHC is slightly bigger than that. I, I will tell you very, very briefly how the principle of, of acceleration works. Um, you part chi, it has to be charged particles. You've heard about, about uh, protons and you've heard about electrons. I will tell you the diff some of the differences in a moment. Uh, charged particles are not accelerated in magnetic fields. They bend in magnetic fields. So you can make them bend around on a, on a circular orbit inside the vacuum chamber. And at some point on that orbit, uh, there is uh, an ele electromagnetic cavity, a cavity which produces an oscillating electric field, very, very high voltage oscillating electric field. And if this works, you, the, the trick is, of course, that every time a particle comes, comes around, the field is in the right direction to give it a little kick and accelerate it a little more. Since it's got a little more energy, you need to increase the field incrementally. And you also need to change the frequency in the cavity because the particle is coming around earlier, if you like. So this is a, this is a play between the uh, in increasing of the magnetic field and changing the frequency in the cavity to keep in to total synchroni synchronism until you get to a point where the magnetic field saturates. Uh, and at, at that, that point, that, that's the, the highest energy you can, you can achieve in, in a machine. Uh, and in the LHC, it was obviously very important to get to the highest possible ma magnetic field. Now, the difference between electrons and protons, I think the other speakers have uh, uh, mentioned it. Uh, Chris mentioned that it's much more difficult to accelerate electrons to, to, to very high energy. But uh, electrons have great attractions. This, this is actually an event. Coming from the e electron-positron collider, LEP, where the two beams are uh, colliding, going, going into the blackboard and out of it. Uh, and here you see an event where you get a, a uh, uh, two muons, heavy electrons, formed in the collision and they, they are going transversely. And look how beautifully simple it is. The electrons are truly point-like. They, they, their energy is very precisely known. So the analysis of the data is very simple. This is an, an event from, from a proton, proton collision in CMS, a raw event. You see, you, you may imagine, why do you want to do that if it's so complicated to analyze. The, you, you've heard that the proton contains quarks and gluons. If you imagine colliding two oranges together, you will very, very occasionally get the interesting collisions between the pips, but you will always get the pulp. You will always get the junk. And getting the, the meaningful events out of the background of, of the, this junk is, is the real difficulty. So why do we do it? And I want to exp explain this. I think uh, not enough em emphasis is made uh, about this. This, this is now a uh, 15 minutes of running of the CMS detector in which they are uh, isolating events which are like, like the previous slide, two new ones coming up back to back, but they've got to pick them out, uh, out from the noise. And uh, the, the, you see this huge background, very high background, and on top of that background you see peaks. These peaks are particles. 
the, they are there because the beam is a broadband beam. You've got a quark in this proton and a quark in that proton, and there's never the same energy in, 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 in a quark-quark collision. The distribution of momentum between the quarks and gluons is random. So every single collision is at a different energy. So in just sitting there at constant energy, you're ma mapping out a, a whole range. And these peaks, they, they, they show 50 years of physics discoveries in 20 minutes. The, these are not new. These have been measured uh, previously. Uh, and they're very useful uh, as calibration, for instance. And I, especially I want to, to show you the limitation of E plus E minus and the wonders of proton, proton for discovery in that J psi peak. The J psi peak was the famous Stanford uh, uh, result that was previously mentioned. Uh, and there were two machines operating at the time. That peak is about 3.1 GeV. Uh, one machine at Donay in Frascati was operating at 3 GeV. They didn't, know, they didn't know that resonance was there. If they don't have enough energy to create the particle, they cannot create the particle. The other in Stanford was slightly higher energy and was scanning around in energy. And when it hit the peak, you see it, orders of magnitude of increase in the event rate in the detector. So the, so the people in Stanford called Frascati and they said, push up your, your, your energy by 100 MeV, which is a couple of percent. That, that was not difficult to do. And they immediately found the J Psi. The Stanford got a Nobel Prize. Frascati got nothing. So the important thing is, when you do not know what the mass of the object you're looking for is, then uh, E plus E minus is very difficult. When, once you know it, then you can go to that peak. Another example is the Z0 particle that you, you can see here. Uh, that was discovered in proton-proton collisions, where, where we didn't a priori know what the mass was. It just popped up out of the data. And then was studied in, in, in great detail in the LEP, electron-positron machine. So protons are wonderful machines for discovery. Uh, and of course, just ab above at 125 GeV, uh, then the, the Higgs popped up without us needing to know what it was. So I think that's a very important thing, the, the difference between E plus E minus. E plus E minus is for precision measurements where you pretty much know where you want to go. Proton, proton, the huge technical problems in getting the, getting the data out of the huge background. One event in a thousand million is a Higgs boson in this machine, and you've got to dig that out of the background. So the technical problems are enormous, but the discovery potential is fantastic. ISR, you, you already heard about the ISR, which was basically the, 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 the grandfather of the LEC, the first machine where the protons and, uh, were used in a storage ring. The Large Hadron Collider, uh, we had a number of constraints. One of the constraints was the size of the tunnel. Uh, even though John Adams uh, insisted that it should be made big enough, or what is big enough? I mean, that, this tunnel is very, very tight, as, as you will see, and we needed serious tricks uh, in order to be able to, to, to do it. Uh, one thing you see here, you see one, one ring, not two. Where, where are the two rings? Like in the ISR, you can see them very, very uh, well separated. Uh, but I will show you when I show you the cryostat of the LHC, how that is done. Uh, the layout of the LHC, the two rings, uh, they're only 19 centimeters apart. And if I go from point one is the Atlas experiment, the, the big general purpose experiment. Point two is the, uh, the Alice experiment, which is specialized for heavy iron collisions, lead-lead collisions, which is for a few weeks a year we do that. Point three is for... Uh, collimating the beams to make them very clean for the detectors, getting rid of halo, etc. Point four is, is the point where that RF cavity is uh, that I showed you. Point five is CMS, and Spain is very big in both Atlas and CMS. Point six is to abort the beam uh, if we need to or when the beams are spent. 
Point seven is the, uh, another beam cleaning uh, region for collimation, and point eight is the LHCB, uh, which is the, the, this experiment uh, dedicated to B physics. So this is what's in that blue cryostat vessel, uh, which was made in Spain, by the way, in, in northern Spain. Uh, these, these, these cryostats were uh, half of the total production was made. Uh, and what you see here are two uh, uh, apertures in, in the center. I don't have a, I do have a pointer. Do I? Is this a pointer? Doesn't seem to be anything coming out of it. No, okay. Never mind. You, the other pointer, where, where is it? Never mind. So you can see uh, here the, the, the two apertures of the LHC in the center. And surrounding these are the, uh, the coils carrying the, the current, uh, which is, produces the magnetic field. And that current is very high. It's 12,000 amperes, because we want to ma make the highest possible magnetic field. So just to uh, normalize, I think in a, 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 a machine, a conventional machine like the ISR, the field is of the order of one tesla before the magnet saturates. In, uh, in superconducting uh, magnets, one can get up to, in, in normal conditions, up to about six tesla. But we needed to get to nine tesla, three tesla higher. And I will show you the tricks that we used to do that. And uh, this is inside a, uh, uh, a, a structure which is to hold the tremendous electromagnetic forces when the, when the coils are powered. Uh, inside a, a, a containing structure, and that all, all of that in the brown is cooled to 1.9 degrees Kelvin. Uh, you, you know the Kelvin scale of temperature minus 273 degrees uh, centigrade is zero degrees Kelvin. So just above zero degrees uh, Kelvin, we got 5,000 tons of material. And that's a cross section of it. Now, I, 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 want, I, I hope I can have the time, because, because uh, for me, this is a fascinating story about superconductivity the discovery of superconductivity and a dis discovery that was missed for more than 20 years. So uh, Kameling Ones uh, was the first to liquefy helium, the, the coldest liquid, and uh, using it in, 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 in 1911, he discovered superconductivity. In the, f the first was mercury, which is not very useful for making magnets with, but it, it showed the property that at, at 4.2 degrees Kelvin, completely loses electrical resistance. Not just gets very low, but completely loses it. And that he called the superconducting state. Um, and then he, he started to get excited. He basically designed the LHC. Uh, the, 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 this was in his Nobel lecture. It's also the question of whether the absence of joule heating makes it fe feasible production of strong magnetic fields. And he built, he built coils out of the, these things and then cooled them down, superconducting, uh, producing very high currents. And he thought this was the answer to everything, getting very strong magnetic fields. Shortly afterwards, he had, had to put water in his wine. Uh, after this lecture was given, it produced surprising results. In fields below a threshold value uh, of, of, of helium, which, which which is not reached within the experiment with small coils, he discovered that the, the, uh, as the current was increased, then it would lose its superconductivity. So he discovered the critical current of a conductor. You can increase the field, up, uh, the, the current, up to a point where then the superconductor is not anymore and it uh, goes normal. You can't go any further. Uh, he also discovered that this was temperature dependent. Uh, that if you reduce the temperature of the, of the liquid below the, 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 the boil, boiling point, then you could go to higher field. And, and this is crucial for the LHC. So uh, th this is a, the, criti the, 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 the critical current of the superconductor we use in the LHC. Uh, you see 
At six Tesla, uh, you can get 2,000 amp, uh, uh, amperes per square millimeter. Uh, and at nine Tesla, it reduces to 500. This is an aeobium titanium conductor, uh, which I will show you in a moment. Uh, uh, and if you want to get increased by three Tesla, we want to go not from six te Tesla, we want to go to nine Tesla, then you have to reduce the temperature. And you have to reduce the temperature from 4.2 Kelvin to 1.9 Kelvin. And then the critical current goes up and you can, you can, uh, <clears throat> you can achieve the much higher magnetic field, the, the three Tesla shift that we need. But in doing that, something remarkable happens. Before I uh, talk of that, uh, this is a, a piece of the superconductor in the, in the, in the LEC magnets. Uh, we had to make 7,000 kilometers of it. It's made out of strands, uh, one millimeter thick, made into a braid, a flat braid there. And if you look at the strand, it looks just like a piece of copper wire. But if you actually etch away the copper, which is only the material to give strength to the wire, then what you find inside each strand, 9,000 filaments of niobium titanium alloy. And the copper is not a superconductor, it's the niobium titanium. So we had to produce 10,000 kilometers of this stuff. Uh, I can't imagine how many, I never calculated actually, how many kilometers of single strand there are. Probably several times around the, around the sun. Okay, now, uh, to finish the Kamerling story and, and the mystery, uh, he, he was doing experiments where he was reducing the temperature above the, 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 the liquid to get down to load. In fact, he tried to freeze uh, helium. And reducing the temperature, the way that you do it, every, every Englishman knows that his tea tastes better uh, at, at sea level than on the top of a high mountain. And the reason for that is that the Atmospheric pressure at high altitude is lower, therefore the boiling point is lower. So if you want to reduce the temperature of a liquid, you pump on it. Uh, and, and he was doing that to investigate uh, superconductors at lower temperatures and also to try, try to freeze the, the, uh, which had been possible for every other gas. And he, did, he, he realized that something funny was happening at about 2.2 Kelvin. Uh, and it, it's funny, but it was to do with the specific heat. And such a thing could possibly be connected with the quantum theory. And that, that is, uh, the quantum theory was absolutely in its infancy there. Now, the, this is the first mystery, because what I'm going to show you is that phase transition. So this, this is a little, uh, uh, a, a little piece of a clip, which starts uh, at... Uh, uh, just, just above 2.5 Kelvin, the, the, the liquid is being, the big vacuum pumps uh, is being pumped, and the temperature is going down. And you will see what happens as the temperature goes down at to, to precisely 2.17 degrees Kelvin. You see this liquid is bubbling away. And at 2.17 Kelvin, that happens. And you wonder, why on earth did he not remark <laughs> that the bubbling suddenly stopped? So, so it was actually, what, what, you, what, what you were seeing there, I think it's worth showing it again. What, 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 what you were seeing there is the transition to a macroscopic quantum state. This liquid becomes a 2.1 sem Kelvin. It's like a phase transition in water going to ice, completely different properties. And the properties of this, this superfluid are bizarre. And it, I remind you, we, needed, we need the low temperature in order to get the three Tesla shift. But then in getting it, we get a, a bizarre liquid with bizarre properties that we can use to our good advantage in order to be able to really build the LHC. Uh, the, the fact that, that th th this is called a, a, a superfluid, uh, and it was not discovered in, until, it wasn't realized until 1933, 
that he was a special state of matter. And one of the, one of the discoverers, uh, Jack Allen, uh, he, he, in, in 1988, he said, in my PhD work in Toronto on superconductivity, University of Toronto was the, the next one after Kamerling, I'd often seen a sudden cessation of boiling at the lambda temperature, but had paid it of no particular attention. It never occurred to me that it was of fundamental significance. And this was a Nobel Prize winning uh, discovery. So they, it took 20 years to realize, uh, working day in, day out with this liquid, that it was something very special. Uh, there's, there's one other property I want to show you of, of this liquid, which we also use to our advantage, and it, that is the total loss of viscosity of the, of, the, of the superfluid component as we go through the lambda point. So what, what you see here is a vessel, a glass vessel, uh, which has not been glazed on the bottom. So it's not, it's, it's not completely, it's very slightly porous, but an, any normal liquid will, will stay in it. Let's see what happens when we cross the lambda point. So you will recognize the transition, transition very well. There it goes. And look at the bottom. The, the liquid is pouring out of, the bot, out of the bottom through the ceramic. And that's because the viscosity of the liquid is completely zero. It's quantum mechanical. It's it, you know, nothing that we can understand by like conventional physics. So the, these properties are essential in, in the LHC. And the first one I explained was the, the, the la stopping of boiling. Why, why does that happen? Well, why does a liquid boil? A liquid boils because the, the bottom of the liquid is hotter than the top. So bubbles form and they, they rise. When you cross the phase transition and the thermal conductivity becomes enormous, then you cannot afford a temperature gradient between the bottom and the top and therefore you cannot boil. So this, this is a graph of the thermal conductivity of, of liquid helium below the lambda point, T lambda, 2.17 Kelvin. Uh, and you see it peaks at 1.9 Kelvin. Uh, and, it, and it's huge. It, it, this is the best copper, oxygen-free high conductivity copper, uh, which is probably the best other conductor that we have. Uh, and this is an order of magnitude higher in thermal conductivity. So how does it help us in the LHC? Well, this is, I, I, I told you that the LHC is in eight sectors. So each sector is about three, three and a half kilometers long. And this is a, is a map of the temperature. Uh, there are 156 dipole magnets all connected together with a constant column of helium around the, around the three kilometers. Uh, and they, they have, they have um, uh, thermometers in them, temperature sensors. Uh, and you see along here the temperature in each of the, the uh, magnets. This is 0.4 to 0.5. So there is a refrigerator at this point. There is nothing over there. And uh, what you see when you start to cool down, what you expect is a temperature gradient, right? You expect the, the temperature to be higher at 0.5 than at 0.4, where the refrigerator is. And you do get a temperature gradient. As you're cooling the, uh, the, 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 the magnet string down, you get a temperature gradient. And as soon as you cross the lambda point, it flattens immediately. You can tell that you cross the lambda point because the, the, the temperature is constant within mini Kelvin all along the, all, all, all through that three kilometers. So this is a, a marvelous extra that we get from having to go, uh, to go down to 1.9 Kelvin. We get this tremendous property, one of them. Uh, another one is the, the very high specific heat, which allows us to absorb uh, temperature transients much better. And of course, the lack of viscosity, we use it in, in, a, in a way. Uh, this is one of the co coils of the LHC. And normally, when you make uh, coils for superconducting magnets, they, they are potted in a epoxy re re resin. In the LHC, they're not potted at all. They're completely left so that the helium can permeate between the, the strands of the, of the conductor and produce a much better interface to the heat. So we are using the thermal conductivity to produce this enormous uh, uniformity of, of temperature and the specific heat and the lack of viscosity for, for other purposes. 
Okay, now I, 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 I want to go rather, rather, rather quickly. I want to show you the, the enormous job of actually building the, this, these magnets in, in a mass production environment. So the, 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 these are coils. Uh, the coils are 14 meters long, uh, made on a winding machine. Uh, then they, they are put into to these uh, containment uh, envelopes uh, in, 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 in a welding machine, and they are actually bent on a uh, 12 millimeter sagitta in order to, uh, for the beam when it's circulating to have a maximum of aperture. Uh, then it, it, the, 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 the magnets are inserted into the cryostats. They're transported to CERN outside of the cryostats, inserted into the cryostats, and each one tested. And one magnet takes more than a week to cool down, test, and warm up again. So this is uh, the test hall where you can see six, six stands on this side, and there are six stands on the other side uh, uh, running. This, this run for four years. Uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, uh, in order to, to clear the, the to, to test all the magnets before they were installed in the tunnel. There is only one shaft that is big enough. The magnets are 15 meters long. Uh, there is only one shaft that is big enough to, 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 to install them, and that shaft is actually on the CERN site. So they are uh, lowered, and then they, they, there's no need for any ground transport around the, the, the countryside, which would be very annoying to everybody. So it's all done underground. Uh, and you see how tight it is now, that you have the, uh, an installed section and magnets passing beside it. And the furthest distance these, these magnets have to be transported is 15 kilometers, going from the entry point to the furthest point around and you can imagine uh, that job, driving it at three kilometers an hour. Uh, you can see the, the guiding line on the floor that uh, if, if the driver goes to sleep, he doesn't bump into the magnets. The transfer onto, uh, uh, from, from the, the, the vehicle on, onto jacks and precision alignment, uh, the electrical splice, uh, each magnet is, is in series with the next, both, both uh, hydraulically through the helium and, and through the, the 12 kiloampere uh, leads. And there, the splice has to be made in the, in the tunnel. And uh, Chris mentioned a catastrophic failure. Uh, for me, it wasn't a catastrophic failure. It was just a failure that had to be fixed. We had much more catastrophic things happening before that. But uh, one of these joints failed during, during testing and produced uh, quite a bit of damage. So, to the uh, de detectors, CERN was responsible for building the LHC. Uh, I was responsible for building the LHC and the experimental areas, uh, but not the detectors. The detectors are built uh, uh, by wonderful consortia of, uh, of universities and institutes with CERN as a partner, as a 20% partner. Um, and, and it's a miracle that these, these incredibly complicated, complicated detectors are brought together in such a way. I, th I think it's a real triumph. But uh, the, the LHC, of course, is 100 meters underground, approximately. Uh, and you, you see the, sh the shafts going down to the four, uh, to, to the four experiments. Two of, the, two of them, LHC, B, and Alice, uh, didn't need much modification because they... they uh, they were already uh, the caverns that housed the, the LEP experiments. But the, the other two uh, needed uh, big civil construction, uh, which I was responsible for, but I didn't know anything about, not an expert at all. So it, it absolutely fascinated me and how it was achieved. Uh, this is the atlas, the way that the atlas uh, roof was cast. It was cast. And then it was held from the surface by steel ropes, while the whole of the rest of the, the cavern was excavated and concreted up from the bottom up to the top. And then the steel uh, ropes were released, and the, the, the top sat on the thing. Fantastic. CMS. 
Uh, CMS actually was, uh, were, the, the civil construction was built by a, by a Spanish company, Dragados. Um, the first surprise that we had with CMS was when we were preparing the, the, uh, the site for the main, co main construction, the, the digging of the, of the cavern, etc. Uh, the last thing that you want to find is uh, geologic, uh, 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 w what we found was the, the remains of a Gallo-Roman, uh, uh, it was a farmhouse. And that's, of course, when you, when, you, when you do that, that stops the work completely. And the, the archaeologists have to come in and, uh, and excavate the site. But that was still, it was extremely interesting. And there were some extremely interesting things. One of them is you, 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 it's looking at you now. And that is that you see how the, this was 4th century AD. Uh, and you see how the, the, the farmhouse is quite precisely aligned with the, fe with the fields around it. Uh, and that we, we were told that, that this, uh, and this is not a preferred position, uh, direction, not north, south, or anything like that. Uh, we were told that the, the uh, cadastre or, or the land registry uh, was laid down by the Romans and was never changed. It was, it was cut up in, into pieces, but it, it was never changed. And this is, a, this is a result. A second interesting thing we found were coins. And these coins, they, they were minted in, in three places. Uh, in, in, in Ostia, which is the ancient seaport of Rome. In Lyon, which is not, which is not, too, far, uh, not, not too far away from Geneva. And in London, 4th century AD. You see, the British, the, the British were cultivated people in those days. They were both members of the European Union and the Single Monetary Union. So those were better days. But of course, in those days, they didn't have the choice. Uh, another interesting annoyance uh, was that in, in sinking one of the CMS shafts, this was Dragadas again, uh, we knew that there was an underground river, but we, we underestimated the, the force of it. Uh, so the, the, the plan uh, it was to freeze, uh, make an ice wall around the region, divert the river, and excavate inside that ice wall using brine. But it turned out to be too, too, uh, too difficult. Uh, and in the end, we had to use liquid nitrogen. So these are pipes of uh, liquid nitrogen being pumped down to about minus 30 meters in order to produce the safe ice wall so that the shaft could be dug inside. And you can see here uh, the, the breakthrough in, into, into the lab tunnel from, from the, uh, the, the Dragados worksite. Uh, this was an interesting one. The inauguration of the Atlas Cavern. Uh, since it was a Swiss company doing that, then we had to have the president of Switzerland, Pascal Kuspan, the tallest guy in that picture in the middle, uh, and uh, we, uh, you see, in the, in the, in the back, the, above Mayani's head, you see a scaffolding. And on that scaffolding is someone with a, an alpine horn. Uh, and it was absolutely remarkable, listening to an alpine horn in the, in the empty Atlas cavern in honor of the Swiss Confederation. But it was even more remarkable afterwards when uh, the, 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 he joined the jazz band, and, and the, this horn is built by uh, uh, the head of our survey group. He, he, make, he makes them and he plays them. And if you had never heard jazz played on an alpine horn, uh, there's something missing in your musical education. It was fantastic. Okay, so now and then, just to, to finish off, uh, Atlas, Atlas was actually installed underground uh, in like a ship in a bottle, uh, and you, you see here you, you, you see the the superconducting toroid coils of Atlas, where the, the beam would be coming straight at you there, and you see a real person standing there. So you've got a you, you, you've got a, a an idea of the scale of the of the thing. CMS was 
different CMS was assembled in large pieces on, on the surface. Uh, and then the, 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 the pieces, uh, the biggest piece, I believe, was 2,000 tons, had to be lowered uh, uh, down into the, into, the, um, in, in, into the tunnel. So to, just to, to, to finish off quickly, I think that the, after, after the, uh, the problem of, of, of the, uh, the, the fault of 2008, it, it took until the end of 2009 to get, to get started. Uh, and then we started to get real luminosity. Uh, quite frankly, both Atlas and CMS benefited from the, from the, from the delay because they were really ready to go by, uh, by 2009. And they accumulated data very efficiently and quickly. Uh, the, it was a, a remarkable year where uh, we are used to be in, in publications in, 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 uh, in scientific journals, but The Economist is a bonus for us because the politicians read The Economist and take note. So it was, it was a great year. Uh, these, these are some pictures, I think you had them on uh, here, of, of Higgs candidates. Uh, again, the Higgs boson decaying in two photons, going back and back to back in, the, in their center of mass system. Uh, the same thing as I showed you for, for that, 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 that CMS scan, where you just sit there and take data, and a peak pops out. Uh, the peak of, of the Higgs is much, much more tiny than the others, of course. But in that uh, seminar in 2008, 4th of July 2008, Atlas and CMS had not seen each other's results. And one after the other, they, pub they showed uh, data, and th this, is the, this is the Higgs to two photons, I believe, uh, from the, both the detectors. If you, had, if you had just shown the, the data from one, one detector, then it would be very interesting. But when you have two detectors which have got completely different technologies between them, and you get the peak at precisely the same mass, then there is no doubt. I think it was just uh, a, a most incredible occasion, and uh, Manuel uh, showed the, the, the main auditorium when that announcement was, was made. So I think um, this is Peter Higgs. He is normally, not, he normally does not go near any experimental apparatus, but he at least came to look at the effort that we, we went to, to in finding his boson. So it, it's, been a, it's been a remarkable thing. I think all our ingenuity has been put into building the LHC. I hope I've explained to you, first of all, about the importance of proton-proton in discovery, uh, that you, you pick up resonances without having to know a priori where they are. Um, I hope I've showed you how innovative the LHC has been in getting to much higher fields than in, in, in any previous machine by going to lower temperatures, and in going to those lower temperatures, going into a new, new domain of quantum mechanical liquid with, a very, with very special characteristics, which allow, allow a completely different approach in engineering. So I, one thing I want to say, get this opportunity, there have been, uh, it, during the construction of the LEC, there have been high points and there have been low points. Uh, and during the high point, everybody's your friend in, 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 in the CERN Council, etc. Uh, and you, you, you quickly learn that in low points, uh, you have much fewer. But absolutely consistency uh, in his presence in the, in the CERN Council, Manuel supported me all the way through and, 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 and it, it really helped, it really did, uh, because it, it, sometimes you feel very lonely. So thank you, Manuel. Thank you.